All right, everyone, it's 2.15. We'll go ahead and get started as the last couple people trickle in. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Nick, Nick DeBurra. Um, as an independent educator and consultant, Nick DeBurra has taught data visualization and information dashboard design to thousands of professionals in over a dozen countries and at organizations including NASA, Bloomberg, the Central Bank of Tanzania, Visa, and the UN, among many others. In 2014, Nick became the first and only educator to be authorized by Stephen Few to deliver his foundational training workshops. And as a consultant, Nick has designed dashboards for over 50 large organizations. His first book, Beyond Dashboards, will be published in 2020. Everyone, Nick DeBurra. Thanks very much, uh, Laurie. Uh, welcome. Uh, God, when they told me that they put me in a 1,200 person room, I, did, <laughs> I was like, really? OK. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm delighted at the turnout. So whenever I do talks like this at conferences, though, I like to start with something positive, uh, you know, maybe even inspirational. But then I thought, you know, for the crowd at Tableau here, I think maybe I'll just maybe kind of keep it real. Because this is reality, right? I see lots of heads already. Mm, oh, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, most dashboards do not meet organizations' expectations. They don't meet users' expectations. User satisfaction is uh, often, in fact, almost always uh, remarkably low with dashboards. We have a bit of a problem. And so, as Laurie mentioned, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a consultant. I've designed dashboards for lots of different organizations. And whenever I go into these organizations, the situation is eerily similar. On the one hand, you have users of dashboards who complain that uh, they have too much information on them, or they, uh, they don't have enough information on them. They you know, miss the information that I need. Or sometimes they just don't look nice enough. Make it look nicer, right? That'll solve the problem. And then, of course, on the other side, we have developers such as yourselves, and they complain that users don't even know what they want, right? They all want something different. Uh, they ask for ridiculous amounts of information, and oh, it all has to fit on one screen, uh, and make it so I can print it out, too. Um, and uh, and yeah, like I said, they all want something different. It makes it really difficult. Uh, yeah, I can see lots of heads. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like I said, don't feel bad if this is happening in your organization. It is ubiquitous. And that's why you know, the dirty little secret of the dashboard world is that the graveyard of abandoned dashboards is well populated. A very large number of dashboards <laughs> simply end up you know, people might use them a little in the beginning, and then they, they just die. And so then we turn to experts, right? How can, we, uh, you know, how can we make our dashboards better? What are the best practices around dashboard design? And we ask them questions like, is it OK to put filters on a dashboard, or is that a bad practice? Or uh, does everything have to fit on one screen? Or is it OK to have information kind of below the fold? Or maybe to spread information out on, on multiple tabs? Like, is that OK? Um, should dashboards have kind of a visually striking design? Should they be eye-catching? Or is the best practice that they'd be more kind of conservative and staid and, and, and subdued? Should we have one dashboard per role? So a dashboard for the CEO and the CFO, and then a different one for the, the you know, head of HR? Or should we have a, like a multi-role dashboard, where you, know, you have one dashboard, for example, for the whole executive team? And so if you've ever done any research into dashboard design best practices, you know that experts disagree on all of these questions. Right? It's very difficult <laughs> to actually get any sort of reliable guidance, because depending on who you listen to, you get different answers. And, uh, but don't worry, it gets worse, because most experts don't even agree on what a dashboard even is in the first place. A lot of you probably know like, this is just a decades-old debate. We've been arguing about this uh, forever. But if you were to ask, pick like 1,000 random people in 100 random organizations, or even like poll the people in, in this room, and if you were to show them a bunch of different types of information displays and ask them to the point, point to the ones that are dashboards, you'd actually probably find a pretty consistent definition emerging, which is pretty much any display with a bunch of charts on it. That's a dashboard. And so, you know, wrongly or rightly, that's the reality out there. And so in many ways, it's analogous to a term like document, for example. You know, document is a, sort of this broad umbrella term. Anything which is like 
you know, a bunch of pages with words and images on them. Well, it's a document. And so it includes a broad variety of types, you know, everything from patent applications to photographs to, uh, you know, mystery novels. And that's why we don't really talk about document writing best practices, right? That doesn't make any sense because the best practices for writing a mystery novel have little to do with the best practices for writing a patent application, for example. And instead, we talk about best practices for writing types of documents. And so coming back to dashboards, well, if a dashboard is any display with a bunch of charts on it, well, it's going to be an umbrella term for a pretty wide variety of different types of displays. So this dashboard, for example, is essentially kind of a filtering interface. Uh, we, you, know, you can see the filters down the right-hand side. We're filtering kind of a large data set. This dashboard is intended to educate us about the refugee crisis to, you know, for a broad audience. This is kind of typical sort of KPI dashboard, pulling information from a bunch of different sources, potentially for an audience of just one person. This, uh, this is more of kind of like an interactive what-if simulator where in the upper left there I can change the, the minimum wage and it'll tell us how that's going to affect our organization. This dashboard is supposed to tell me how my workout is going. This one tells me how fast I'm going. And so all of these you know, displays with a bunch of charts on them show different kinds of data to different audiences and most importantly, they serve very different purposes. And so if we're talking about dashboard design best practices, you know, any dashboard design best practice, what are the chances that that's going to apply to all of these different types of displays? Zero, probably. It'll apply to some of these, but not to all of these. And so I think what, it, you know, what would make much more sense is, is if we were to talk about uh, dashboard design best practices for different types of dashboards. But the problem is, is that we don't have any. We don't have different names for different types of dashboards. We just call them all dashboards as if they're a part of the, uh, of the same category. And so I think that this is really at the core of why dashboards have basically been letting users down since literally for the last 30 plus years, since the dawn of dashboards, really. And so I think we need a reset. We need to rethink, we need a different approach to how we design dashboards because the current way that we're doing it is clearly not working because of the low user satisfaction that we almost always see. And so one might even say that we need even a reboot. You guys know this show? All right. It's called the IT crowd, British. Yeah. All right, yeah, you're my peeps, you know it. And so I think that that reboot, that reset, kind of starts here. First, we, first thing we need to do is to stop calling these by the same name. We need to have different types of, uh, of displays. And so I started thinking about this a couple of years ago. And at the time, I was wondering, as, as you probably are wondering right now, well, aren't there like maybe thousands of different types of displays with a bunch of charts on them? And uh, as it turns out, just through looking at many different dashboards and working with many different organizations, I found that actually no, there are about 13 different types, pretty manageable number. And so I organized them into essentially a taxonomy of different displays that unfortunately everybody calls, or not everybody, but many people call dashboards. And so at the highest level, the taxonomy, uh, I have this taxonomy organized into two, uh, two high level categories. There are what I call dynamic data displays. And so as the name would suggest, these are displays that are based on data that is updating. It might be every 10 seconds, it might be every month, but they're based on essentially live data. And then I have static data displays. And so these are displays which are based on static snapshots of data that may never be updated. Or if they are, it'll be on a, maybe an ad hoc uh, kind of basis. And then within uh, dynamic data displays, these are the kinds of displays that probably most of you deal with. Uh, they're used inside of organizations to interact with the organization's data. And so HR dashboards, um, uh, you know, uh, finance, uh, sales dashboards, that kind of thing. They tend to have, and in my opinion certainly should have, a very kind of staid, subtle visual design. Uh, don't, uh, don't involve a lot of storytelling because it's often impossible, right? These are displays that are based on live data, so they look different every time the user looks at them. So it's kind of up to the user to figure out what the story is. 
they have, um, uh, usually they're, they're, they're interactive, sometimes with fairly complex interactivity. And the primary purpose of these types of displays, it's all about answering data-related questions. Questions like, is everything okay? Is there anything I need to react to at the moment? Or how many widgets did we sell in Germany in Q4 of last year? Those kinds of data-related questions. And so within dynamic data displays, I have four subcategories. There are monitoring displays, performance displays, item displays, and what I call canned analysis displays. And I'll show you examples of these in, uh, in a few moments. And then on the other side, within static data displays, if I start to look at the characteristics of those, or the best practices even, now everything changes. Now they're different, right? So yes, they're used inside of organizations, but also used outside in marketing campaigns and training programs and you know, awareness campaigns, things like that. In this case, you want to have an eye-catching visual design. You want to have a graphic designer involved because that can kind of make or break these things often. Um, usually involves storytelling. And if, it, if they don't, they probably should. That's definitely a best practice here. And you can do it because these are displays that are based on a static snapshot of data. And so they don't change every time that the user looks at them. So you can tell a story around it. They, um, they tend to have very simple interactivity, often none, maybe just a bunch of charts on a screen or even on a poster, for example, but static charts. And the primary purpose isn't, it's not about answering data-related questions, it's about causing some kind of desired change in the mind of the user. And so I have three types of displays for that. There are persuasion displays, which as the name would suggest, for persuading people to adopt a point of view or take a course of action. Explanation displays, for educating people, explaining without necessarily persuading them of anything. And then engagement displays, which are basically for getting attention, right? You know, I'm going for reach, clicks, uh, that kind of thing. And so like I said, I'm gonna show a few examples, give you kind of a whirlwind tour, because uh, in an hour, that's, that's about what I can do, uh, of these 13 types. So within monitoring displays, really the kind of the, the, the core type of monitoring display or sorry, uh, the, you know, what are these for? Well, a couple of things. Monitoring displays are really for enabling users to spot new developments that, or developments that require action currently. It's all about what do I need to react to right now? Right now meaning either this minute or this week or this month, depending on the situation. That's really the primary role. Secondarily, they should enable users to maintain situational awareness. So basically what's normal. Uh, and how might that be sort of changed over time. The catch is that it has to take very little time for the user to actually do this. Because how often do users need to do these things? All the time, continuously, right? They never stop. And so that process of figuring out, is there anything that I need to react to better be quick because I'm doing it every day, every week, uh, every month. And that's a real challenge. And so I have four types of, uh, of displays for, uh, for accomplishing this. The first one is uh, what I call status displays. So what is a status display? It's basically a display of all of the metrics that a given user role might need to react to at some point. And so uh, you, some of you might recognize this. Uh, this is one of my colleagues, Stephen Fuse's uh, dashboards. He talks about it in his book, Information Dashboard Design, which is one of the courses I teach as well. And so this is all of the information that the VP of sales, for example, might need to uh, react to. And I think it does a, a quite a good job of, of showing this. And so I'm gonna kind of start up a, a little workflow diagram of what the monitoring process would look like for a typical user. So they have a status display, one display per role. And so there's one for the CEO and one for the CFO and it's not the same. And they look at it every day, every week, every month, depending on the situation. Now, I'm coming back to the status display, but you might have noticed, or maybe not, but there's a slight change to this one. This one is a little bit different. This text in italics, which I'm sure you can't read in the back, <laughs> is basically showing me kind of meta information, information about the information. And so there's some weekly data up here, and it's telling me that the week starts on Monday and ends on Sunday. Uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, in the regions here, it's telling me that North Africa is, is included in the Middle East basically static information, information that never changes. 
Should that be on a display that the user is looking at every day, or every week, or every month? No. It's taking up valuable real estate, and it's adding clutter. And so we need to get it off of the displays that people look at all the time. Where do we put it? Well, that's where the second type of monitoring display comes in, which I call metric introduction displays. As the name would suggest, these are displays that basically people uh, are exposed to typically when they're being trained, when they're being brought up to speed on the dashboard or the organization. And, uh, uh, and, and basically, that's where I put that static information. You know, uh, like, uh, how, you know, how often is expected to be updated, where we get it, how it's calculated. Uh, some of the stuff, actually, that we saw in the keynote this morning might go on a display like this, but it's not going to go on the display that I look at every day, every week, every month. And so these are generally even slides that people are shown when they're being trained on something, or, or on, the, on the dashboard. And so I'm going to add this to my monitoring workflow. So we have the user who starts by being trained on, on metric introduction displays. Once they've seen it, they don't have to see them again. I mean, maybe we would put them behind a help button or something. If they forget, they can come back to them. But they only generally need to see them once. And then they review their status display every day, uh, every week, every month. So I'm going to come back to the status display for a moment. Now, of course, when the user spots a metric that requires attention, especially if it's one of, the, one of these that have been flagged, for example, well, of course they're going to want to diagnose it. Right? They're going to want to know, like, why is it behaving uh, as it is? Unfortunately, what we often do with dashboards is we try and pack all of that sort of diagnostic information onto, or right into the dashboard. But of course, each one of these numbers has potentially hundreds or, or at least dozens of you know, child metrics and peer metrics. And so then the dashboard explodes. And so instead, my recommendation is if somebody says, OK, I want to know more about this metric, then we bring up what I call a metric diagnostic display. So it's a separate display. And it says, basically, this is everything we know about this metric. It's history in, in days, uh, you know, what is it, trailing 14 days, uh, 12 months, eight quarters. Uh, it broken down by child metrics or whatever hierarchies are relevant to it. It's peer metrics, uh, maybe some statistical kind of signal detection tests that we uh, run on it. And so there's a pretty good chance that I'm going to be able to diagnose why this metric is behaving uh, as it is. And so I'm going to add that to my monitoring workflow. So the user starts with the metric introduction display, it's being trained, status display every week, every day, every month. When I see something of interest, click metric introduction display or uh, metric diagnostic display. When I've diagnosed it, I close it back down and then keep on reviewing my status display. So I'm going to come back to this uh, status display again for a moment. So in this situation, we are actually kind of lucky, right? Because when we spoke to the VP of, of sales operations and we made a list of all the metrics that they need to, or that might need to respond to at some point, it all fit on one screen. Right? And so in the, in the upper left, there's only about seven or eight unique measures. Uh, and then there's you know, maybe five, uh, five regions, uh, eight products or something. Well, what I'm finding more and more in my consulting work is that this is more and more rarely the case. That you know, instead of uh, like seven unique measures, there's like 25. Instead of five regions, there are 50. And so it starts spilling off of a single screen pretty, uh, pretty quickly. And in fact, this is happening with almost every uh, organization that I work with, where instead of a status display, they actually need many status displays to, to show all the information that they could potentially need to respond to at some point uh, in the future. And so in these situations, my monitoring workflow doesn't have a status display at its center. It has status displays, potentially dozens, potentially hundreds. Uh, one of my clients is a large retailer. They have 500 stores. Each store spits out 20 metrics a day. That's not fitting onto one screen. But the reality is that the VP of operations does really need to know if any of those, like, what is that, 10,000 numbers uh, is going wrong on any given day. What do we do? How do we enable people to stay on top of so much information? Well, I'm going I'm to share with you one of my secret consultant weapons from my, my arsenal. Uh, it's a concept called valence. 
And uh, I'm actually going to take a bit of a detour. I'm going to leave the taxonomy behind for a minute or two and talk about valence because it's an incredibly useful concept. And I'm going to come back to the taxonomy and talk about the rest of the types of displays in a little bit. So what is valence? What does this mean? Well, this is a term that I've kind of borrowed from uh, psychology research. And so uh, in psychology research, valence simply means the emotional response that something provokes in people when they're exposed to that thing. And so, for example, there are things with positive valence, which are like puppies and good grades and, and, and delicious looking food, right? So when we see these things, we have a positive emotional response. And then there are, of course, things with negative valence, which is like bugs, I actually like bugs, but most people don't, uh, bad grades, rotting food, uh, things that provoke a negative uh, emotional response. And so we actually see valence on some dashboards. About 10 to 20% of dashboards that I come across have some form of valence indicators, and which usually looks something like this, right? So for positive valence, like this, or, or negative valence, uh, like this. But like I said, only about 10 or 20% of dashboards that I encounter have any, anything like this. Most dashboards do not. They just look something like this. No indication of, you know, is this a good day? A bad day? Is there anything here that requires my attention? Are there any crises that I need to deal with? No idea. What does that mean that I have to do as a user? I got to go through every one of these values one at a time and figure out what kind of day are we having and is there anything in here or that I urgently need to respond to? And so this is going to be slow, but remember we said that that review process cannot be slow because they're doing it all the time. Uh, I'm also going to miss stuff, right? I'm not totally familiar with like every single one of these numbers. So there could be problems in here that I'm just going to miss because I don't know that that's not a good number uh, for that metric. Whereas a display like this, which actually has valence indicators, I don't know how clearly you can see that, um, but besides some of these metrics, there are red and green dots. And so even though I'm looking at literally 10 times as much information, right? Before, on the last dashboard, there were about 15 metrics. There are about 150 here. But I'm going to get through this way faster. You know, what kind of day were we having? Well, there's some red dots here, but no, no, nothing too bad. Uh, what do I need to pay attention to? The dots. And so valence is what's going to enable us to get through a lot of information very quickly. The trick, though is that they have to be extremely trustworthy. Users have to be confident that, on the one hand, there are few or no hidden gotchas, and so metrics that actually required attention but that didn't get flagged. We can't have a lot of those because then people go back to reviewing everything because so they don't trust the, the indicators anymore. And on the other hand, we're going to have few or no false alerts. Right? And so if, if we do flag a metric on the dashboard, it better require attention because otherwise you're wasting the user's time and you're spamming them with alerts that don't actually need uh, any attention. And so uh, as I mentioned, yeah, about 10 or 20% of dashboards have some kind of valence indicators, but they generally don't pass those tests. They're very poor uh, types of valence indicators. And you'll actually recognize all of these. And so uh, the most common ones are change versus previous period, right? Where I show today's value versus yesterday or versus last week or last month. Single threshold indicators where I pick a threshold value for each metric, and if it falls on the undesirable side, well, I flag it as having negative valence. Or uh, above or below target, where I pick a target value. Today we're 5% above or 3% below. Good, satisfactory, poor ranges, you all know those, right? So like I said, these are all surprisingly bad at flagging valence reliably. Why would I say something so weird? Well, let's look at one or two of them. So how about change versus previous period? It's probably the most common method that, that uh, is used on dashboards. So here we have calls per hour uh, up 6.5% since yesterday. That's got to be good, right? It looks like we're trending upward. Just for fun, I look at the last 14 days. Whoa. Clearly, we are not trending upward here. Uh, it, we just happened to bounce up on the most recent day. And so this, the valence indicator, which looked positive, was actually wrong. It's not. Or how about um, unit production? Uh-oh, 14.7% down since yesterday. That's got to be a crisis, right? Well, again, just for fun, we look at the last 14 days. 
So that 14.7% drop, that's, that's right at the end there on November you know, 16th to 17th. Is that a crisis? No. Right. This is just a volatile metric. It's down 14% since yesterday. It'll be up 22% tomorrow. So this is wrong too. This is not a crisis, and yet it looked like one. Uh, customer satisfaction, so hey, 22% up, you know, up 22% since yesterday, that's got to be good news, right? Again, if we dig in, huh, maybe not. So basically, we completely screwed up two days ago, and the yesterday we just recovered. Is this fantastic? No. This is actually kind of back to baseline. Or uh, website availability. So uh, this looks normal. You know, we're only off less than 1% since yesterday. Um, you know, no action required, right? We look at the last 14 days, whoa. Normally, this is like at 99.9%. And in fact, when you think about it, this is website availability. What this is telling me is that one out of every 100 re page requests to our website is failing. This could be the worst single problem on our dashboard, and yet it looks like nothing. And so I'm not exaggerating when I say you literally might as well put random numbers up there. That's how valuable these are. And I've seen plenty of panics from people are, oh my god, it's a crisis, but it's actually not. And so especially on a, a display like this, well, you know, where I'm looking at a lot of measures. So quick, what, what requires attention? Are we having a good day or a bad day? This is going to be very time consuming for me to actually get through. And so, uh, so that doesn't work. How about single threshold? It's probably the second most common method that I see. Of course, this is where for every metric, we have to go through and pick a threshold value. And then if it falls on the undesirable side of that threshold, we flag it as having negative valence as being a concern. But when we ask users to actually set thresholds, it can be very difficult. Because if you think about it, what we're asking them is, OK, what is the single point where this metric goes from being a problem that needs to be solved to suddenly, boom, fine. And oh, by the way, you know, I feel exactly the same about it after that, right? You know, 600, 700 doesn't really matter to me. It's like, really? That is not the way that it ever works in reality. This is not the way that anybody actually thinks about metrics. So of course, users struggle to set these values. It just doesn't line up with what's, what's in their head. What's in their head probably looks something more like this. You know, if, well, if it was ever at 500, that's not just bad. That's like, oh my god, I'm going to get fired. Right? And so on my dashboard, that better be like ping, 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 like just mega attention grabbing. And then around 550, well, then it starts to become like a major concern and then a minor concern. And then right around 650 there, I don't really care anymore. But at 700, well, now I start to care again, but for a totally different reason. And wow, if I ever got up there to like 750, 800, I would definitely want that to be flagged. That would be extraordinary. That would be exceptional. And yet, with single threshold, it's just not going to get flagged at all. Which is why a dashboard that implements this method is going to be slow to scan. I have to investigate every single one of those indicators and go right to the end before I know, are there any emergencies out there? And anything that is doing extraordinarily well well, it's not going to get flagged at all. And so not a reliable way to flag uh, valence. And in fact, there are similar problems with uh, uh, above below target, uh, good satisfactory poor, compared to 20-week trailing average. These all have serious, uh, serious problems. And uh, if you want more information about this, I have blog posts. Uh, my, my site's called practicalreporting.com, uh, and I have detailed descriptions about in fact, many other reasons why you would want to stay away from all of these uh, methods. So what do we do? How can we flag valence in a, in a reliable way? Well, for the last, I don't know, two years or so, I've been using what I call the four threshold method. Uh, I haven't seen it elsewhere. It's so simple. I can't believe that nobody else is doing this. But this is how it works. So for each metric, as the name would suggest, I don't need one threshold or two like some of the other methods. Or methods. I need four. The first threshold is crisis. So this is the point which has a very precise definition. It's the point at which I would literally drop everything until this was resolved. Right? And so it's easy for people to imagine that. At what point would I drop everything? Yeah, 550, for sure. I'm dropping everything. And then there's actionably bad. 
And so this is the point at which it's, I'm not just concerned about it, but I'm so concerned that I'm actually going to take some kind of action. I'm going to uh, move uh, more resources into that project. I'm going to fire somebody. I'm actually going to do something. Again, it's easy for people to kind of imagine that. And then on the flip side, on the mirror side, we have actionably good. And so again, this is where I'm not just happy about what I'm seeing. I'm so happy that I'm actually going to do something. I'm going to uh, add more people to that initiative. Uh, I'm going to promote somebody. I'm actually going to take some kind of actual action. And then the fourth one is extraordinary. And so this is basically the best case scenario. Realistically, how good do we think this, this metric could ever actually get? We'll probably never get there, but if we ever did, we would want the dashboard to flag it as being extraordinary. It should grab a lot of attention, essentially. And then we can use those four thresholds to flag valence of metrics, usually using a combination of hue and intensity, uh, which are two properties of color. And of course, anything that is in between actionably good and actionably bad doesn't get flagged because, by definition, it requires no action. And so then, if I line this up with uh, what, uh, compare the, what the dashboard understands to what is in our user's mind, well, this, is, this is what the dashboard understands. So there's basically these gradual transitions from like crisis to don't care to extraordinary. And of course, this lines up very well with what's in users' minds. And so they find it a lot easier to set these thresholds, and it, it matches reality a lot more closely. And so a display that, used, that implements the four, four threshold method might look something like this. So right away, I can see that I have one, two, three, four crises. And I can see that there are uh, you know, maybe, maybe five or 10 sort of moderately uh, severe problems that I need to deal with. How long did it take me to figure that out? Less than one second. There are a couple of important variants to the four threshold method. Uh, of course, there's the colorblind safe version because red and green are the worst colors for colorblindness. Uh, so ideally, you have a toggle that allows colorblind users to uh, say that they're colorblind and it switches over to the, uh, the, the blue-orange palette. Uh, you need to make a small change when you have metrics that where lower values are considered to be more desirable, like expenses or accident rates or something. You basically just swap the thresholds around. Uh, and for what I call Goldilocks metrics, which these are metrics where there's like an, an ideal value, and we don't want the current value to go either above or below that, and so there's a small change we need to make there as well. And uh, you can also use some actually surprisingly simple statistics, um, which I've sort of borrowed from the field of statistical process control. Anybody ever heard of that? Or XMR charts? Yeah, like 2%. That's your next Google search, uh, super useful. Anyways, and so you can actually generate reasonably decent default values for these four thresholds based on the history of literally any number of, of metrics. And so this starts to become super useful in this situation, right, where I have many status displays, many metrics that could, that could require action from, uh, from the user. And so in that case, what we can do is using the four threshold method and some statistics, we can actually identify all the metrics that are likely to require attention, pull them together onto the fourth type of display in, or monitoring display in the taxonomy. So now I'm coming back to the taxonomy, and I call that an alert, dis uh, alert display. And so an alert display is, we, we've actually already seen this, but it's basically pulling together all of the metrics that look like they require attention onto a single screen. And so even though there are, what, like 150 metrics or something here, there are actually tens of thousands of metrics sitting behind this, which aren't being shown because they're essentially behaving normally. And so the user can stay on top of enormous amounts of information in a very small uh, amount of time. And so now I'm going to add that to our monitoring workflow. And so that's kind of the whole process. Hopefully it's fairly obvious why you know, you need these four types of fairly task-specific displays, but unfortunately, most organizations don't recognize these distinctions, and they just have the dashboard, right? That's supposed to do all of these things. And of course, it's not going to do them well. We're trying to pack too much functionality into a single display. And so I actually have a name for these. I call them Swiss Army Knife dashboards, because we're trying to pack too much capabilities into a single tool, right? But I mean, is, you know, is this a good saw? 
No, it's a terrible saw, right? Is it a good magnifying glass? No, it's a shitty magnifying glass, right? And so we're much better off breaking these tools apart into spe purpose-specific tools that are going to do a better job. So, uh, so that's it for monitoring displays. I also have performance displays. So what are these for? Well, for answering questions like, are we achieving our strategic goals or mission? Uh, are we performing better or worse than we were before? Most importantly, how can we perform better in the future? So these are actually different questions. They're not the same questions that I was answering with monitoring displays. So I have two types of displays for these, uh, for, for, performance, uh, for showing performance information. The first type are what I call KPI overview displays. So now that's actually the first time that I've used the term KPI. Before, for monitoring, we're just talking about metrics. But now we're actually talking about performance, so key performance indicators. And so uh, this is going to be basically a display of 10, 20, at most maybe 30 carefully chosen key performance indicators, KPIs. You know, I could talk for a whole you know, couple of days about how to, how to choose those, but the bottom line is they are carefully chosen to be good indicators of how well we're progressing excuse me, towards our uh, strategic goals. And then, of course, uh, when I'm having that, that monthly, quarterly performance discussion, I'm going to look at each KPI in detail to figure out how we can get better at it, which is where KPI detail displays come in. So this is basically very detailed information about one KPI. Uh, it's history, it's uh, breakdown by, by you know, child metrics, all sorts of information. Uh, in the upper right, there's a commentary. And so before the performance meeting every month or every quarter, somebody who knows what they're talking about has analyzed this metric and made some recommendations about maybe what we might try to you know, maybe run some experiments or something to improve, improve performance in the future. And so people often ask me, like, why, why did you split things up this way? Why do you have monitoring displays and performance displays as being separate types? Well, I, I think of monitoring displays, whoops, uh, kind of like radar displays, right? So we're, we're kind of surveying the vast ocean of metrics. I guess that would be sonar, anyways. Uh, and we're looking for blips, right? This is all the tens of thousands of num numbers out there. Is there anything out there that I need to react to? And I'm going to be doing this all the time, of course. But then there are performance displays, which I think of as kind of like report cards. They don't come out very often. They don't have very much information on them. And they're really all about how can you perform better in the future. So they're very different types of displays. They're looked at different frequencies. They serve different purposes. And yet, again, most organizations don't distinguish between these two, uh, two processes. And they just have the dashboard. That's supposed to be used for performance uh, discussions and for monitoring. And so here you end up with uh, what I call the 200 KPI problem. And so we have our organization has 200 KPIs. Uh, some of my clients have like 1,000. If you have 1,000, they're not key anything. That's everything. But anyways. Uh, and so, you know, so even, even you know, let's say 500, that's not enough for monitoring. As we've seen, we, we probably need tens of thousands for monitoring, and yet it's way too many to have a meaningful performance discussion around. And so yet again, we end up with a display that does everything poorly because we tried to pack it together into a, a single tool. So that's it for performance displays. Third category within monitoring are what I call item displays. And so item displays are all about enabling our users to interact with potentially large data sets. Uh, the 30,000 students in our university, the 50 million transactions that our company processed last year. And so we're answering questions like, um, how many widgets did we sell in Q4 of last year? Uh, or which region contributed the most to our fundraising campaign? Questions that could easily be formulated as a database query, essentially. And so uh, I have three types of displays in the taxonomy for addressing those types of questions. They're, uh, the first type, or what I call disaggregated item displays or ungrouped item displays, where I'm looking at individual items because I can because there aren't very many. And so, for example, this disaggregated item display is showing me detailed information about the 25 or 30 hospitals in our network that I'm responsible for. And I can show everything. I don't have to group the hospitals uh, or show totals or averages because there's only 25. So sure, I can show everything. 
If I have some valence logic sitting behind this, if I'm using the four thresholds, then adding some valence indicators actually makes this way faster and more effective to scan. Very text heavy, uh, and so certainly my colleague Steve would say, no, something like this is better, where I'm showing the, the information in a more graphical way as opposed to a more textual way, and I would certainly agree with that. This is one of Steve's dashboards as well, which I would classify as a disaggregated item display, in this case of 30 students in a classroom. But what if instead of 30 students in a classroom, I have 30,000 students in a university? Well, I'm not gonna use a display like this because I'm not gonna have a 30,000 row table uh, on my screen. So at that point, I need to move to the second type of uh, item display, which I call an aggregated item display, where we're no longer, we can't look at individual items anymore because there are too many. We have to look at groups and totals and averages of items. You've seen a lot of these before probably. It look you know, like this, so this is showing us the, whatever, 10,000 customers we have, and they're sliced and diced by the various dimensions that we have about them, what products they've ordered, what region they live in, et cetera. And then modern tools like Tableau, of course, allow me to interact with this large data set by filtering and sorting and, and doing all the things that you know very well. And then the final type is uh, uh, our item detail display. So these are basically where I want to uh, get all the information that we have about one student or about one transaction. And so these are generally pretty simple to design. This is actually from Google Analytics showing me all the information we have about one website. Ignore the horrible pie chart in the upper left, but that's a whole, whole other topic. Um, and then finally the last type are uh, canned analysis displays. And so these are basically displays that we as the IT team or the BI team have created for people who aren't necessarily analysts or statisticians. We've packaged up some potentially complex analysis and put a simple user interface in the front of it so that people without a lot of sophistication can, uh, can use it. And so this dashboard that I showed you before, I would call a canned analysis display the one where I can, I can change the, uh, the minimum wage, and then there's some very complex calculations that happen in the background to show how that's gonna affect the various aspects of our business. I, as a user, don't have to understand any of those calculations, so, uh, you know, but I can still, I still benefit from them because the BI team has packaged it up in this way. So, um, so those are all the types of dynamic data displays. Now, because I'm organizing information onto different types of displays, I have to put some thought into navigation and discoverability, right? People have to know where to get the answers to different types of questions that they're gonna have. And so when they log in, we can't show them the dashboard because we don't even know what kind of question they have. And so we kind of have to ask them. And so I recommend something like this, basically a home screen or you can call it a portal if you want. But the idea is we have to ask them what kind of, like why are you here? You have, you've got some kind of data related need. Uh, are you just checking to see if everything's okay? Or do you have a specific question about our customers or about orders or something like that? And then based on their answer, we're gonna then bring them to a display that is specifically designed to answer that type of question. And so it's gonna do a much better job. Now, of course, when they land on one of those types of displays, they're gonna see new information, and that's gonna prompt new questions in their head, and so ideally, they can then click on any, uh, anything in, that, type of, in that, that display that they've got to and jump to a new type of display uh, that answers that new type of question which just arose in their mind. And so over time, this is something you can build out, and it basically will become kind of like a, like a network or an ecosystem of displays with people jumping around in different types based on the kind of question they have. Not something, of course, you need to do right away. There's certainly work involved here, but ultimately that's the goal. So, so that's, those, that's kind of the whirlwind tour of dynamic data displays. Within static data displays, um, you might remember that uh, one of the characteristics of static data displays is that they, um, you want a graphic designer involved, right? You want it to look slick and, and professionally designed. Oftentimes, that'll make or break one of these types of displays. And so I don't actually talk about these types of displays uh, very much because, uh, well, I'm not that guy. I'm not an artist, I'm not a graphic designer, I'm not an illustrator. Uh, I know a lot about visual perception, 
but I don't know a lot about designing, you know, artistic uh, uh, displays, and yet that's very important often for these types of displays. I did include them in the taxonomy, though, because if you look at the top, right, well, my inclusion criterion are, are displays that people often call dashboards, and oftentimes people do call these displays uh, dashboards. Uh, I would call a lot of them, like, infographics, or even like posters, or, or even like presentations. Uh, but a lot of people call them dashboards, so okay, fine, I'll, I will include them then. And so very briefly, uh, uh, the three types that I have are uh, starting with persuasion displays, and so this would be an example of a persuasion display where the idea is, of course, to, uh, well, in this case, to try and persuade an audience that, uh, that fathers should have more parental leave uh, in, in the US. And I, as a Canadian, agree with that. I think that they should. Um, also, and then the second type are explanation displays. And so these are displays which uh, are not designed necessarily to persuade people of something, but to educate them, to bring them up to speed on a concept, on a topic, in this case, on the refugee crisis. Um, and then the final type are engagement displays. And so the goal here, the primary goal, is really about getting attention. I'm going for clicks or likes or views or something like that. I'm trying to grab, get, generate as much interest as I, as I can in, uh, in a data set. And so in this example, uh, it's, I guess, showing, so it, I pulled this out of an article about kind of mortality statistics. And it's a little interactive thing. You can put in your gender and your ethnicity and your age, and then I guess it'll tell you how you're going to die. Um, and so, OK. <laughs> Uh, I can see that this would maybe get a lot of attention, but the filters are really there, mostly to get people to play with it, They're not really there for analysis. Um, now, oftentimes, of course, the goal here is to, uh, is to get attention for a reason, because I'm trying to persuade the audience of something, for example. But the primary purpose is to get attention. If I've designed an engagement display and it doesn't get shared, it doesn't get clicked on, it's automatically a failure, right? regardless of what uh, any other purposes that it might have had. And so, um, so those are the 13 types of displays in the current taxonomy. Since I started working on this probably two years ago, it's, it's evolved quite a bit. It will probably continue to evolve uh, to, to some degree. Uh, but I think you know, it's largely settled. Probably canned analysis displays are going to get broken out maybe a little bit more. But I think it's fairly settled. But if you disagree, let me know. I'm, I'm, you know the, the, the manuscript for the book I'm writing is not quite finished yet. So still opportunity to make changes. So now, I want to kind of bring it back to the beginning. What do we do? What do we do with this word dashboard? Should we even be using it? Like, what does it even mean? Well, uh, my colleague Steve, Stephen Few, he would probably say that only one or two of these types of displays are actually dashboards. Other experts would say, no, no, no. All the ones in the left-hand column, those are dashboards, but the other ones are not. Other experts will say, no, 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 these are all dashboards. And maybe there are other types of displays that are dashboards, too. Ultimately, I don't think it actually really matters that much. You, know, you can call them waffle irons if you want. The important thing is to recognize that there are types here. Right? We get into trouble when we talk about these things as all a single type of thing, but they're not. They're very different. And so I propose names. You know, like I said, we could use these names or other names, but the important thing is that we have to recognize that there are these different types. And I think if we do that, we're going to get past a lot of the decades-old controversies which is, have been plaguing the discussion around dashboards for, you know, since, since the 1980s, actually. It'll also, I think, make it much easier for people like us who design dashboards for a living because when, uh, when somebody comes to us and says, oh, I need a dashboard, we could quickly identify, ex OK, exactly what kind of thing are you asking for? And then we, so we figured that out. We can equally quickly figure out, oh, OK, what are the best practices that apply to my project, and which are the ones that I can safely ignore, which is going to be a lot of them, actually. Because there are going to be some best practices that apply to all of these, but very, very few. Maybe something like have a strong visual hierarchy or something. Everything else is going to be different. Some best practices will be shared. You know, they'll apply to maybe three or four of these or something, and that's fine. Very few are going to apply to, uh, to all of them. And so as uh, Laurie mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm writing all this up in a book. It's going to come out next year, hopefully Q2, something like that. And so the book basically 
uh, talks about, of course, each of these types of displays in detail. Right? I, didn't, I didn't have time to do that today. Like, how do you design an effective alert display? Or how do you design an effective disaggregated item display? And so that's all uh, covered in the book. Uh, although I have actually started teaching uh, the workshop uh, just a couple months ago. I've taught it about half a dozen times uh, so far. But it's available, obviously, if you want more information for your organization. That's something we can certainly talk about. Uh, hasn't been announced yet, but we just, uh, we just locked in uh, May 25th in Stockholm. If you happen to be in Europe in the spring, Stockholm is beautiful in the spring, uh, there will be a public workshop where anybody can sign up. Uh, and uh, there will be uh, uh, US ones as well uh, announced in, in the next month or two. And so before my final slide, I've been told that I have to remind you to uh, fill out the evaluation if you found this to be uh, interesting. Uh, maybe they'll have me back next year. And uh, I will leave it at that. If, uh, feel free to connect. I am the only person with this name on LinkedIn, and so I'm easy to find. Uh, uh, I think we actually have a few minutes for questions, which kind of surprises me. I thought I was going to go right to the end. But, um, but yeah, I think we have some mics uh, if uh, anybody has questions about what I talked about.